Hey there. Hello. Here everybody comes. Coming in. Hey, Samira. Great to see you. Gretchen. How's it going, everybody? A little colder here today in New York. I guess that's all I have to talk about every day. <laughs> We're getting ready to go. Johnson. Just watching people come in. I feel like my phone's a little crooked here, maybe. Is it? Theo. Hey, Sophia. Adam Larson. Look at all these folks. Jules, great to see you. All right, I have to make sure my volume's up all the way so I can hear. Well, Sophia, you know, I'm doing this. And I'm just waiting for Mr. Hall. I might have to message him because I haven't seen him yet. But we practiced this the other day. So I just have to see. Yep, he's coming. He's messaging that he's coming. Uh -oh. Let's see, somebody sent a request. Nope. <sighs> He's on the way. Thanks, Gretchen. Gives me something to do. Keeps me a away from trouble, the mean streets of New York, the empty streets of New York. All right, let's see. There we go, and let's, here we go. We're just about live. Okay, God, live. sorry, man. I'm an idiot. <laughs> it's fine. 
you're I'm kind of uh, avoiding... technically an idiot. You're smartly avoiding social media. <laughs> yeah. The best thing you can do. Uh, although, what else are you going to do these days? Yeah, true. It, true. It took I'm, I'm worldwide, kicking myself. A worldwide plague to bring you to social media. So That's I right. always start these by talking about who we're talking to. Uh, and a lot of people who know, here know some about you, but I think <clears> they probably don't know all about you, especially what we're going to talk about today. So I'm just going to do my little intro. Okay. What if you know Michael from his work in the hit series Dexter, as well as his role as David Fisher in the similar similarly well-known series Six Feet Under. He's an actor of stage and screen, known the world over, but fewer people know about his singing in the lead role of David Bowie's last work, the theater piece Lazarus, or that Michael was singing in profile roles for years prior, including the leading role of Hedwig, Hedwig and the Angry Inch. Well, I can't speak today. And some years of work on Broadway in the revival of Cabaret, 99, <clears throat> 2000, right around then. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so when, when I first heard you singing, I said, wow, he's, he's really done this before <laughs> a lot. Yeah. Yeah. The first time I sang for you was in that very apartment. Yeah. And I, I want, I want you to tell that story, but I want to work towards, okay. <laughs> I want to work towards that story. You grew up in Raleigh. Yep. And Raleigh North Carolina. Nice and then you went to school in Richmond, Indiana under the premise of pursuing a law degree or that was that yeah, just something you told I, yourself? It's something, it's not even something I told myself. I think it's something I told other people so that they would stop asking questions. It was a way <laughs> to say, you're going to a liberal arts school to study some sort of philosophy, English, you're not sure what. And I'd say, yeah, yeah, but I'm planning to go to law school and that would placate them. And they, But I had no intention of ever becoming a lawyer or even going to law school. Did and you while know I was there, then that you that you wanted to pursue the arts and that you want to do? That... I I think I did. I think it was a secret I kept, maybe um, even to myself or from myself. Um, consciously, I think I just wanted to protect myself against what I knew I'd be greeted with, which was discouragement or skepticism or you know just like why would you do that? That's that's not going to work. Um, What's your fallback and? Yeah, exactly. But uh, when I got to school, I, I I did a lot of singing. I was like in choirs. I was in a like a concert chorus that sang the B minor mass with the local symphony orchestra. And I was with this um, smaller chamber group that performed Palestrina masses and things like that. And we actually had a stint in Vienna, Austria, where we where we did that. Um, but then I, I took an acting class my sophomore year and realized that it was, you know, it was the thing that turned me on like nothing else. And um, and so I ended up um, starting to do a lot of plays and taking classes in the theater department. I ended up majoring in, in theater and then going to get a, a master master's degree at NYU for acting. Yeah. So I'm a master yeah. of, I have an oh, MFA. You're a master. A master of it's, fucking I think it's acting. too bad that they don't have to call you master. Just like if you get a doctorate, you, they call you doctor. I mean, you know, if I was a stickler, I would make people do it. But yeah. <laughs> but uh, what were you listening to growing up? Because you, you started singing really young. Yeah. Yeah, I started. I think the first time I sang um, officially or if it was in a boys choir. Um, uh -huh. I was like, I was a first soprano in the boys choir. And um, I mean, the first things I probably sang were hymns at church. I went to church as a young kid. I sort of stopped going to church when I was in my adolescent years. But, um, uh, but I grew up, for the most part, in North Carolina. But I had three years from second to fourth grade when I lived in Vienna, Virginia. And, you know, it was... It was the time when you would just go out and play until everybody's mom said, come home. <laughs> and uh, you're just bands of kids playing. And um, so many of the kids I played with had older brothers and like basements and record collections. And, mm. and so I, I think the music that I listened to like second, third, fourth grade was like, um, 
the who and queen i really loved queen and um elo um the pretenders um, yeah. stuff like that that i got from from um you know older brothers record collections um and um that's all it, such good stuff and you somehow skipped a lot of the uh, you didn't name any of the kind of crappier music that was on the radio i mean it wasn't all crappy there was some really good music on the radio right but... right yeah i mean i mean i did i did come home from church again um every sunday and listen to casey Kasem's top 40. oh yeah um and um i remember like holding out um or I, well i guess it wasn't holding out it was about getting home early enough to hear the stuff that was closer to 40. like um i remember back in black was close to 40 for a while and i, I was like oh man i gotta hear that song again you know it was like second third grade it's like yeah you know um but uh yeah, yeah, that was that was the stuff I really, I really, um, I really loved when I was a kid. The uh, Queen, the game, I think, was the first album I I was given, and mm. uh, yeah. Johnson Johnson J is here, you know, our first guitarist from London, uh -huh. and he's a huge Queen fan. Yeah, he's watching. So. Oh, cool! Wow, yeah. wow. Well, um, well, I mean, I must say that I am I'm really. Um, honored to talk to you uh in this forum g considering the the kinds of people who you've been talking to on this um uh, you know i'm very very honored to be oh man one of them. well i'm i'm so happy to have you here to talk about music because i feel like I've, enough people my hope is to show more of the side of people that people don't that uh, a lot of people don't see you right. know when people know you they probably call you dexter on the street oh they yeah know, yeah <laughs> And and I think that music is a really strong part of who you are as a creative artist. Yeah, well, it's you know it's been a part of what I've what I've I think I think when I was um, studying to be an actor, I maybe focused on non musical stuff just because, and I think this has changed to a degree since I was in school. But I felt like leading with the musical stuff might limit my ability to do other things. Um, sometimes if you're a musical theater performer, um, people assume that that's all you can or want to do, which is a ridiculous, to, it's ridiculous to think that's all you can do because it's the thing that requires you to actually do everything or right. a lot more than, you know. Um, so, but I, but I did dead, end up doing doing um, musicals, cabaret, like you said, which was just an incredible experience. And I did Chicago. I did Hedwig, you know, relatively recently. Yeah. Um, but it was only it was only um, with this band that that I sort of felt I don't know um, inspired or <laughs> empowered or given the permission to start making music of my own. And that yeah that. Um, has a lot to do with the experience that I that I had with you doing Lazarus. I think there was there was something about um, there was something about being around you and the, and the rest of the the cast, but the rest of the musicians and and being called upon to to perform some of those songs and um, that along with doing Hedwig gave me a taste of what it felt like to to front a band <laughs> and. Um, and I think I've always written just for myself, but this was uh, something that emerged uh, in a way that I didn't anticipate as a way to to do some writing. You know, I write the lyrics for the band. And, and I just, I, I'm so thankful to Matt Katz-Bowen and Peter Janowitz for, first of all, starting to make music with one another and then, you know, inviting me to, to sing on some tracks they made. And it just without meaning to we we became a band um yeah, yeah. Uh, actually for anybody who's not aware of this michael is is uh part of a trio um it's a really really interesting new project called princess goes to the butterfly museum and your ep your complete six song ep was just released on the second right saturday uh, yeah yeah it yeah. was um i think it was I don't even know exactly when the it was Facebook released, page, but it's been released. <laughs> but it, it's really cool. 
I think yeah, it's really cool. Yeah. Oh, like good. I said, I listened to it twice this morning. I was walking <laughs> around. I got up really early. I couldn't sleep. And yeah. I, I listened to it twice. And it's it's very moody. And it harkens to some kind of early 80s analog synth sounds that I love. And yeah. it feels... Well, um, Matt, I mean, you should... I'm, do you know Matt Katz Bowen? The, I don't. I mean, I you, don't. Should, you should meet him because you're... You're both, you know, wizards <laughs> with, uh, you know, with the, um, not just as, as um, keyboardists, but as, as, you know, masters of all the different things that they can do. And he's, um, and he um, is uh, the music director for Blondie. So he definitely yeah. is not only steeped in, but is regularly revisiting that sort of 80s yeah. sound. Yeah. And you met you met both of them uh, during Headwake, right? Yeah, I met Peter Yanowitz, uh, the drummer um, for the band. And I mean, he's so much more than a drummer. It's in his studio apartment that he's turned into a music studio that we've recorded everything we've done and where he sort of sits at Mission Control and acts as a de facto producer. But he was the drummer in the band when I was doing Headwake. And so I, I got to know him. Um, pretty well, and we maintained a friendship after that. And I met Matt um, just briefly backstage. He was he was like watching the show because he was preparing to step in to be the music director. And then he became uh, he filled that role, and Peter continued to play drums for the band when the show went on tour. So they developed a friendship, started making music together when they got back. And I heard some of the tracks and just casually said without any sort of aspiration, I just thought it would be fun to, uh, I said, if you ever want somebody to sing on these, that might be fun. And, and, and I did, and, and um, the, the, the melodies and lyrics seem to, I guess, be maybe not quite what they expected and also something they felt really worked. And, um, and Peter invited me to, he's like, hey man, if you have any musical ideas, just, you know, sing them into your phone. <laughs> and I started, and I really took that and ran with it and, and would send them, you know, more, in some cases, more or less complete songs, but without, but, but singing them a cappella into my phone. And, um, and I, they just, um, you know, and encouraged it. And I, I don't know, I just, I think I, I stopped thinking that it's something that I, that I don't do and started to think, why not? Maybe it is something I do making, making music, writing music. And um, now I sometimes compose with a little crappy Casio tone <laughs> just so that I have something to That's kind of, great. as a, as a frame of, you know, structural reference, but uh, yeah. And there are limitless tools now for your phone or your iPad or your computer. Or your yeah. It's remarkable how, good if you're in a good space and you put the phone in a good place how good your vocals can be recorded on an iphone there were actually vocals i recorded on the iphone in some of the mixes like the original vocal vocals i recorded in some of the mixes that are on the ep and there's a song that i wrote when i was working in prague um that i sang into my iphone and it is the vocal on the track it's a you know something yet to be released but um I didn't even like sing it with a metronome. Matt just sort of, you know, got real vibey with my changes in tempo. And as we, nice. when we try to re-record it, it, it never feels quite as alive. So sometimes it's that it's sometimes it's that first take. And I was talking with some musicians in the past week, some really famous recording musicians, and they were one musician was talking about the the innocence of the first take. Yeah, you know where it's where where it's really uh it's the first feeling you have about it yeah and it's it's the first it's it's the time when you're doing nothing but moving into it and discovering it every time after that there's at least some element of trying to recapture or redo or perfect some idea that came before that first time so yeah there's yeah. something magic about it and actually that brings me to something i wanted to ask you about uh over the years i've heard some great producers use the term uh, with regarding vocals, talking about uh, a vocal, a well-performed vocal as a good read. 
And I mm. never thought about that before. I think it was Phil Ramone who said, oh yeah, that was a nice, that was a good reading. Right. Like an actor would read a part. Yeah. And I, I wonder if that, if, if that must strike with you even more. Yeah, like, it really does, you know. I've never really thought of it in that, those terms. I certainly have thought about thought about it that way when I'm doing a play reading or but but yeah I think I think when something feels good it's um you know about if there are minor melodic tweaks you make or or uh, the way you you know bend or sustain a note or whatever but ultimately it's the the sense of it having felt good and being a good read is a sense that yeah it was um it was consistently inhabited you know and in, in, in that sense, it is very much a, an acting sort of thing. I mean, I probably, without, without um, thinking about it, do characterize the different songs we do and think about who's singing them, the character singing them. I mean, they're all aspects of me, <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. you know, and that's something, of course, I mean, I'm sure we will talk about David Bowie, but... You know, he was someone who I always admired. And I think as an actor, I admired the way he characterized his um, his performance and his voice from song to song, album to album, era to era. And um, yeah. 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 And, and you know, along this line of, of a read and the way that you interpret a song, and I know that you... I feel like you sell yourself a little bit short if you say, well, I only started creating songs recently, but actually your interpretation of songs is also a, a form of creation. And oh, yeah. when you think about a singer like Bonnie Raitt, mm -hmm. who I don't know that she's written any songs that she's sung. I could be wrong. I'm just, I haven't done my research, but she's such a stylist yeah. with the way she sings songs. And any of the parts that you've, played where you sung the song even back to cabaret or even uh work that was preceding that you were still an interpreter of the song and you were still giving it your read yeah no that's true that's true i appreciate that and and yeah i mean i i i think your job as an actor whether it's a song you're singing or a, a speech you're giving or whatever is to make it very much your own you know yeah and um it's sort of a, a different and just as um, uh, real a challenge to, you know, d doing this, the songs in Lazarus and, and feeling entitled to, to make, <laughs> to make something that, that Bowie wrote and, and performed your own. Um, yeah. As, as an individual, as an actor, within the context of this fictional play, it was its a, it's its own it's its own challenge, and um, it was uh, you know one of the great gifts of my life to be invited to do that. I think he was rare in his uh, in his in the way that he was so inviting people to people to make it their own. You know? Yeah, and he really wanted your take on it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a it's a testament to his kindness and openness and collaborative spirit and a testament, I think, to his assurance about his material, you know, that, that it, it can stand up to multiple yeah. interpretations and can, it, it's, you know, it, the air of it can flow through all kinds of different instruments, human instruments too. Yeah. And I, I think this is a fine time to tell this story because uh, right. David was, David was really, he was very funny and he never, he didn't want to be the center of attention in a way that would distract people from their creative process. He was always really welcoming of people uh, giving stuff, their own spin. He wanted to see what other people would do with the work. Yeah. And so I, I think I called, I called you and the first time we met, I said, oh, you want to run over the songs? Yeah. Yeah. We, we, I don't, if I if I remember correctly, I hadn't met you in person until I no. came to the apartment. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I came over. Um, I already had the job. Um, Robert Fox, producer, and Ivo Van Hove, and maybe some other 
creative powers that be had come to see Hedwig and I'd met Evo on another couple of occasions. And I, I had the job, but I had yet to meet you and I had yet to meet David. Right. Um, and, and perhaps more to the point, sing the songs uh, for him. So it kind of felt like the final step in the audition process in a way. Um, and I, but... think, I think I, I did something not so nice to you because I think I said to you, do you want to get together and go over the stuff? And then I had been talking to him and I told him that you were coming over. Yeah. And then he decided he wanted to come over too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you let me know. So yeah, I, I mean, it was nice that I was able to get there, I think an hour before David, and we were able to go through everything. Um, just so I, you know, filled the space with my voice a little bit. Um, but um, yeah, I came over, we, we sang through um, everything, I think maybe we decided on a key for It's No Game, and uh, sang through all the stuff. And you know, maybe revisited little pieces here and there, but that was basically that. And then uh, David, I mean, I know he came up the stairs and he walked through the door, but in my memory, he sort of materialized in the room. <laughs> and um, he was dressed uh, beautifully head to toe in what seemed to be Alexander McQueen, including the skull designs on his shoes, which are a lyric on the, on the Black Star album. Um, and uh, he had, it was raining out a little bit and he had an umbrella with a beautiful um, silver knob on the end that almost felt like a cane. He smelled amazing. It just so happened that we're basically exactly the same height. So every time I looked into his iconic eyes, they were just right there, you know? <laughs> and <laughs> and I had to, I had to, um, yeah, I remember he was, he was immediately like, he had this ability to sort of take the edge off his aura. <laughs> you know, yeah. he's an icon and he didn't lord it over you. He kind of put you at ease. Um, and he immediately was like, thank you so much for doing this. And I was like, well, thank you for being David Bowie. You know, I didn't say <laughs> that. I just said, well, you're welcome, you know. And, um, and he... Uh, yeah, he sat down after some small talk, you know, I, I mentioned an acquaintance we had in common, you know, and um, we, uh, you know, and shot. I, I, was, I was sitting at the piano and you were, yeah. uh, you know, I live in a very small apartment. You yeah. were as far as you possibly could be at the end of the piano, like yeah. almost out the window. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, um, I was trying to give myself as much space as I could, <laughs> I guess. Um, yeah, and and he uh, and yeah. After a while, I was like, okay, well, we're here to sing through the stuff. So you want to sing through the stuff? And I said, yeah. And um, I think I can't remember. I think it was you who suggested we I, sing. I, Where are we now? First, yeah. I didn't want to even pick which song to sing first. I couldn't. And um, and I was feeling up to that point pretty good. I'd turned a part of my brain off, you know, just to kind of deal with the surreality. And, um, but you started the opening of Where Are We Now? And um, I've said this before, but like my little butterflies turned to bats, you know, and I was like, oh my God, what is happening? I can't, this is not, what if I forget how to, <laughs> my tongue works, you know? And, um, and somewhere during that intro, David, very generously said um, something like, yes, now sing my songs for me, you know, and he, he, <laughs> he named the sort of absurdity of the moment. Yeah, and, and we you, all and you laughed. Said, you said, oh, good, so we all know what's happening here. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, and, um, oh. and so, yeah, so, I mean, I, I love that song so much, and, um, and I love singing it, and, you know, one of the, once I started, I was just in the song and it was okay and I was feeling good and I was arranging myself in such a way that I was looking at you and David was very much in my peripheral vision and I just was like, don't look to your left, don't look to your left. <laughs> and, um, and, but we got to the, the final, uh, the final bit of the song and I heard um, these oohs 
And I looked and David had his eyes closed and he was singing the, the backing vocals of the arrangement for the song that would be in the show. And like everything just went, so I was like, everything's okay. It's gonna be okay. And this may well be the best moment of my life. <laughs> you know, it's just, it was incredible. And, and yeah, we, we went through the rest of the songs that day. He was in no way, I think he, he talked about the, the melody of the, um, the really of, uh, hard one. <laughs> <laughs> the, oh, of Killing a Little Time. Oh yeah. I, well, I remember he, he had a backpack and he, I think we sang through it and I had um, learned that song in part from a demo that JJ Appleton made. Yeah, who's um, here watching right now? Oh, cool. Hi. <laughs> and, and, and David said, have you heard a demo? And I said, oh, yeah, I heard that one. And he said, oh, well, I have my own demo um, in, in, on, a, on a CD. Uh, <laughs> would that be helpful for you to hear? And I was just like, yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, that, that would be helpful. Um, it was yeah. just, he was just so, so great. I've obviously committed to an uncomfortable seating position. Yeah. Um, and, um, and yeah, he played that. And that was one of the only sort of, really specific things he ever said. Um, he was talking about the lyric of that song. Um, what is it? Oh, God. The, uh, um, I, I lay in bed, the, the monster, fed. the monster fed, yeah. the body bled, I turned and said, yeah, and he said, when you get to that point, you know, just be, he, he basically was like, that's a shitty rhyme. The, yeah. that, that's, that, that string of four rhymes, they're crappy. And sing it as if that's all the feeling deserves. All it deserves is this crappy rhyme. And I was just like, yeah, that's great. I mean, it was great to hear him sort of, I don't know, knock his own rhyme, but also talk, talk about how it was intentional. And also just, it gave a window into the way his approach does have to do with where he's coming from, almost from an actorly standpoint, like what's his point of view? Um, where's he located? How does that inform um, the delivery? I mean, I think that's always the case. It's just, uh, it was cool to hear it made conscious, yeah. um, but it was an incredible day. And, um, and I, and I felt like, you know, from here on out, no matter who comes to the show or whatever, it's, I have nothing to fear because I just sang these songs yeah. with David sitting there on the couch as far That's away cool. of me as he could possibly be, but still probably about six feet away. And you, you really, you really gave something unique to that role. You really did something I think really unique with that role. And I think we talked about your voice because some people said, Oh, he's, you sound like David Bowie, mm -hmm. but I, I think you remarked that even in college, people had said that your voice sounds a bit like David Bowie. Yeah, my friend, my very good friend, Ben Schaefer uh, is a music editor, but he um, he noted how in The Passenger, the Iggy Pop song, the, the, the La La's that Bowie sings and the backing vocals, he pointed out, he was like, that sounds exactly like you as the MC in Cabaret which is, um, and I listen and it's like, yeah, it really does. And that was the first time someone pointed out that there was something about the timbre of my voice that was maybe similar. I mean, I think that's just a matter of, um, you know, similar length and width of vocal cords, yeah. <laughs> you know, or, um, but yeah, I didn't really have to consciously lean towards trying to sound like him. I think I, yeah that was sort of just inherent in, in how my voice sounds. So that was sort of, I don't know, the, the honoring <laughs> uh, his sensibility in terms of the sounds he made was, was kind of taken care of. So I was in a way uh, free to, to interpret it the way I interpreted it without feeling like I was consciously diverting from I don't like you know what I mean <laughs> yeah 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 well, you know you're, you're such a you're such a uh, disciplined hard worker and I want to back up a little bit because 
even with Cabaret being a, a full Broadway production, seven shows a week, that's a lot of vocal work. Right. And you must have done a I lot of I have to correct you and say eight shows a week. Eight shows a week, right. Yeah. And we did it. We did the five show weekend. So we would do it at eight o'clock on Friday night, two o'clock and eight o'clock on Saturday, and then at two o'clock and seven o'clock on Sunday. So it was almost, yeah, it was like five shows within the course of um, 49 hours, <laughs> which was a That's lot. That's pretty hardcore. And, and were you working really hard on your voice leading up to that? Were you, were you just, I mean, it's almost like being a, an Olympic runner to get your voice in that kind of shape. I, um, I wasn't um, leading up to getting the job. Once I got the job, I started, you know, getting, I started getting in shape. I worked with um, Liz Kaplan, uh, you know, great vocal uh, singing teacher and coach. Um, and she's really great about, first of all, knowing your instrument, but then looking at uh, the score of what you're doing and creating warm up exercises that don't warm your up, warm yourself up just gen generally, but with the sort of demands of that score in mind. And so I was able to create that with her. And that's something I, I yeah, I, I, even if I didn't feel like I needed to, I would warm up um, pretty much every day. And I think that kept me, kept me, in, in shape. And, and so in that period of time between Cabaret, when you were off doing, I mean, you were so busy with Six Feet Under and then Dexter, mm -hmm. were you singing at all? Were, um, you, were you missing singing? Were you? Yeah, I, was, I wasn't singing in a disciplined way. I wasn't singing. Um, there were, there was a, a production of a John Michael Lacusa musical um, called, it was called Arshaman, as if it was Rashomon on a movie kiosk with the O, the first O gone. Anyway, that was what it was called. And then I think it was end, ended up being called I See What I Want to See at the Public. I wasn't able to do that production because of, but I did that show, which was, um, was, was very um, legit and, and demanding vocally. And so I, and I, di I did Chicago while I was doing Six Feet Under. Um, over the course of Dexter, I don't think I did any, uh, I maybe did like a workshop of a musical once, but yeah, I was sort of, da you know, come in and out of it and get and find myself needing to get into shape or getting into shape just for having done something. But I wasn't singing every day or, you know, I probably was, I was probably singing in the car <laughs> yeah. or, or in my trailer at work. I mean, sometimes I just, um, sing to pass the time, you know, waiting to go on set or, or, but it was never, or it wasn't always with the intention of going to play a specific role or do anything specific. It was just, uh, singing to sing. Yeah. Because fast forward to Hedwig and all of a sudden you've got this, now you're singing real rock and roll and yeah. you've got to really put it all out there. Yeah. Yeah. On a schedule. Yeah, and I mean that was you know that was Liz again who who I who I saw who I visited again and and did sort of the same thing. Hedwig was was um, Hedwig was even more intense in a way because there was no understudy, so <laughs> it was like yeah yeah, and um, I never missed a show. I definitely went through uh, a period. Or, or probably more than one period where I was pretty uh, phlegmy, you know, or had a lot, yeah. a lot of gunk in my head. And um, I actually started to incorporate into the show, just turning up stage and hawking loogies at the band. <laughs> <laughs> it was like a game we'd play. I'd just turn and spit. They'd <laughs> dodge. And um, I think some of them thought it was kind of funny, <laughs> but I didn't I'm care. <laughs> <laughs> and then you know and then Lazarus I was always amazed how you're you kept your stamina and the other thing about Lazarus is that Thomas Newton is he's anguished yeah and there's a lot of like and I, I don't know if you wore it that way but there's a lot of potential tightness in the voice and yeah yeah it, it is um in a way I think um 
maybe the the way to the way I contended with that, and this isn't anything I necessarily thought about consciously, but the songs when they emerged over the course of the piece were sort of a chance for release. Mm. You know, I mean, he was very much in a state of anguish and angst and confusion and decay and all of yeah. it. Um, but when the songs came, it was almost like a a moment of grace, like with Where Are We Now, or a moment of certainly release with It's No Game. Um, and, you know, some of those songs I really did have to think about, with It's No Game in particular. I, mean, I think David even said, he was like, that's a song that I never did live. Because yeah. I couldn't live up to the, like, I couldn't do what I did on the Scary Monsters recording. Yeah, I was uh, amazed how you sang it, because it didn't sound f fake. It didn't sound... Forced. Right. And I remember having that conversation with Liz and saying, are you going to hurt yourself? Because uh -huh. knowing the schedule that was coming, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I tried to, you know, that that sort of what is a full on just throat shedding scream on the recording he did. It's like, well, I'm not going to be able to do that eight times a week. So how can I sort of navigate that <laughs> in yeah. a way that 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 feels reasonably sustainable but also doesn't feel like i'm you know shying away from the the emotion of it yeah and uh and but then you went forward to uh the music of uh princess mm -hmm. and the vocals are, are are docile and beautiful and and some falsetto and i i think it's really great uh and i feel like you're idling a little bit not 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 that i don't think that it's beautiful i think it's an artful choice right but you haven't gone with your rock and roll voice on anything yet yet yeah i think i think um we are um have mix or are mixing and and probably soon to master i i, I think we're, we'll i don't know exactly when but before too long we'll have another release maybe a full length um and some of those songs are a bit um gnarlier <laughs> ah. um, vocally and and just musically um but um but yeah i think i think um i think i maybe have leaned toward relative ease or understatement with the delivery um Sometime as a sometimes as a counterpoint to uh, music arrangement that's kind of cacophonous and crazy, um, yeah. but um, but yeah, certainly the stuff on the EP is is very um, downshifted. <laughs> I do think ketamine is my favorite track on. Yeah, that you guys have done. I, that's I think the first just, one we released. Um, it's so fantastic. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's um, that you know, that bass figure was just something yeah. Peter sent me that he had. Um, I was, I had those lyrics and had a very different sort of melody that I was messing around with, but he sent me that and it just locked right in and the melody just revealed itself. And um, yeah, that, um, yeah, I love that. I love that song. It's definitely a good one to accompany just a walk down the street or it makes everything it's just it makes things feel like cinematic and ex yeah, I, I expansive walk, I, listened, I listened to it as i walked across the williamsburg bridge today it was you know six thirty in the morning and yeah watching the couple ferry or a couple of tugboats or something right but, uh how does now that you're writing these songs does it make you go back and reflect on the songs that you you sang before and think about how they were created and do you have a different perspective now about that um yeah perhaps a bit i mean i think the songs that i um perhaps i i you know i don't really know that i that i actually give that much conscious consideration to how the songs i'm creating are created so you know, like, it'll, um, 
so as far as looking back at other songs, I mean, I think the, the songs that I love the, mo the most are, you know, you can appreciate maybe their chord structure or their changes or their, you know, um, their architecture, but the best songs always remain sort of mysterious and like a little piece of magic <laughs> somehow. Um, so I, definitely doing this has done nothing to, um, um, I can't think of the word, but um, it hasn't taken any, any of the magic away of um, enjoying other music. Um, it might, it might just make me more tuned into it. Yeah, well, I guess that's that was my thought about it is that maybe you you have a new perspective mm -hmm. on uh, you know when you start to when you start to become better at a skill and you start to understand the process yeah. and see some at uh, you know I think songwriters composers and songwriters never feel like anything's completely done, but right. when you get to the point where you can let something out into the world, then you start to have a better insight about how that process feels and how it works and yeah. Uh, and the more I, I see other songs and I watch songwriters, then I really start to appreciate that craft uh, of mm -hmm. composition and the craft of songwriting. One thing I've noticed is um, I never, when it's, uh, when it's songs that I'm writing and lyrics I'm writing, I never have to work to memorize the lyrics. I just, I just know them, which is, um, you know, with, with somebody else's work, you usually have to take a, take a little time to just make sure you have the words, but it's an interesting phenomenon, you know, that, 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 that seems to be the case. I mean, <laughs> cut to me like on stage for getting the words to a song, <laughs> but, but, um, but that's been interesting. Um, and it's just, I mean, you know, I, I feel like it, it just makes me all the more appreciative of all the things I realize I, I don't do, you know, just, you know, I'm not a proficient player in any way and, and, you know, don't know a lot of theory, but, you know, the guys in the group, um, definitely like encourage my innocence, you know, <laughs> and to just remain, I don't know, the more, uh, I think they've, you know, they, they've been making music professionally for a long time. So they've enjoyed being around someone who's just kind of um, being turned on to how that feels, even though I'm, you know, not 19 years old. It's still. Oh, yeah. But I, th I think that I think that you bring something to it that they don't bring to it. And I think that's part of the ma magic of that collaboration. I was talking with Nick Littlemore last week, who's not at all a musician, really, but he's a lyricist. And he has a completely different perspective about music than I do. And I couldn't possibly yeah. come up with the things that he does. And I'm sure that, you know, Peter and Matt feel the same about yeah. your contribution. I think we feel that we all, you know, collectively feel that way. It's it's nice to be a part of a group that's really so completely dependent on all three of us, you know, that's a three-legged stool, I guess. Yeah. Well, uh, do you, uh, of course, your phone is going to be, as soon as we're allowed to, as soon as it's safe to go out, your phone is going to be ringing nonstop. Do you see yourself carving out some saying no to things and trying to carve out more time to make this a yeah. bigger part of your life. Yeah. I, um, I mean, there, there have been some things that I don't know if I can say that I wouldn't have said no to them if the band weren't, uh, in the picture, but definitively, but yeah, I think there have been some things that I, that I looked at and considered the time commitment, the schedule, perhaps the geographic challenge of being taken away to another place and, and, and said no, because I wanted to keep moving forward with the, with the, with the music. Um, I, I'm not ready to give up my day job <laughs> and sure. stop acting entirely, but, but I, I, you know, um, this has emerged as a really, um, really satisfying, gratifying, um, sort of rich creative place to to spend time and and I want to keep doing it. We've actually been able to I think we've since 
I got up here. I'm in um, Ulster County in a place uh, upstate, and I got here about five, five and a half weeks ago. And I think we have just by remotely sharing ideas, we've written like four or five songs. Oh, just, just, great. um, and it's um, in a way, it's just facilitated this new way of kind of trying to construct things, um, which has been, which has been fun. Um, yeah. Well, somebody who seeks creative endeavors will continue to seek creative endeavors, no matter the medium. I do believe. Yeah. And yeah. And I think that a new creative endeavor is even more exciting. So uh, I'm happy that you're doing it. And I think the record is great. And I can't Thank wait you. to hear more of it. Yeah. Yeah. I might might uh, sneak you some stuff. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, please do. Well, thank you so much for, for coming by and talking of course. about music. And... No, I, I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, it was really great. And, I'm still uh... enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, well, I don't have any more to ask. Do you have any stories that you want to share or we, just, we could just say? No, I think I'm, I'm, go I'm good. There's nothing, uh, <laughs> nothing coming to mind. Okay. But uh, All right. say hi to everybody. Okay. Thanks a lot, Michael. All right. Take care. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you.